Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. We continue this morning in our quest to returning to being the church that we began a couple of weeks ago. Last week we, we look at, yep, wrong one. I pulled up the wrong one. That's just wrong. Yeah, I'm sorry. Just give me a moment to get the right message here. Shame on me. That's what happens when you don't bring paper. Returning to being the church, part three. In our first message, we explored what the church did on day one when 3,000 were saved and they were baptized. Remember what we read as, uh, as, Paul, as uh, Peter preached, 3,000 people in Jerusalem were saved then. We then saw that the church focused on the apostles' teaching, on fellowship, on communion, and on prayer. Last week, we went a little deeper into what the church is by exploring the first half of the 3-5 focus of the church by exploring who the church is. We saw the church was, or is, people who are focused on Jesus' mission, people who are communicating with God, and people in spiritual community together. This morning I'd like to explore the second half of the 3-5 focus, what the church does. The church worships, the church fellowships, the church teaches, the church preaches, and the church serves. And we'll look at all of these this morning. I promise that we're not going to have a, a Greek lesson this morning. But we need to know a little bit about the words that are being used and what, they, what the biblical writers are meaning when they use these particular words. So let's dig into the second half of the 3-5 focus. And we begin with worship. The simplest process of God becoming clearer to me. It is uh, the word family liturgia from where we get our English word liturgy. Liturgy is the process of what the church does. It is the process of the worship service. Some churches are referred to as liturgical churches, that they have a written, every week, a written script of how they do it. In the Catholic church, you have your prayer book that lays out every Sunday what the service will be like, and to some extent, even what the, the priest will speak in his homily on. We're going to be all over Scripture this morning, so um, try to keep up, but it'll be on the screen for you if, if not. Um, turn over in your, in your Bibles to Acts chapter 13. Looking at Acts chapter 13, verses, verse 2. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. The context of this verse is Paul and Barnabas in Antioch, while the church was, being in, was engaging in worship. Now understand what I'm talking about here. I'm not just talking about singing songs. We, in the Western world, we've gotten this misconception that worship, that when the church worships, it's just when they sing, what we just did. That's not all, that, that should be worship, but that's not all that worship is. Worship is everything, really, that we do. The study of His Word, the fellowship, the time we spend together, the time we pray. Paul would later say that the gift of our body is spiritual worship, is something that we're to do. So the context here, Paul and Barnabas are in Antioch. The church is worshiping however they're doing it. And they understand from this period of worship, this period of fellowship with God, that Paul and Barnabas are to be set aside. They're to be dedicated. They're to be made holy, set aside for the work to which I've called them. 
Remember, Paul was the accuser of the church. He was the persecutor of the church. Came to know Jesus. Came to be a follower of Jesus. And the church in Antioch, I, I just love how, the, how God, God has a sense of humor. You know, I, I think sometimes he, he just chuckles when we finally figure out how he works. You know, he, he, he caused the church to disperse through the, effect, through the action of Paul. Paul is there persecuting them, arresting them, killing them. And so they, they flee. And one of, the, one of the larger churches to be established in what becomes a, a missionary-minded church in Antioch, Paul all of a sudden becomes pastor of. A church that was established because of, of Paul's persecution is now the place where Paul is ministering and where the leadership says, hey, we need to send him out on a missionary journey. We need to commission him and Barnabas to be missionaries. The Spirit led them in becoming missionaries. The word worshiping in this passage, in this verse, is the, Greek word, is the root of the Greek word liturgia, from where we get our English word liturgy. When you dig through all of the lexicons and all of the original Greek helps available concerning the Greek word liturgia, you begin to see the use of the word at the time of Dr. Luke. Like words in our language, they, they, they morph in their meanings over time. By the time Dr. Luke is writing the book of Acts, there's a couple of things that are being conveyed by this, by this word. Dr. Tony Webb, who majored in Greek, he is, a, he is truly a Greek scholar besides being the developer of GSE, has, has, developed, has boiled it down to two, these two points. The word worship is viewed as a very high status or a thing to do. The use of the word liturgia conveys the concept that it's, it's something of, of really high importance, high status to do. There's also personal involvement or even assignment to see accomplished. So when we read the word liturgia, or in most of our English Bibles we read the word worship, Understand that it's something we're assigned to do. It's active, it's not passive. In fact, all of the words we look at today are active, not passive. You can't just sit back and let church happen. That doesn't work. That's not the way God intended it. Something personal about it. Something personally assigned about it. And it's something that's to be considered as a high status for us to do. What I see here is liturgia speaks about being very actively engaged in the worship of God by being engaged in ministry. Not just spending 15 minutes singing with the church. It's being actively engaged in doing what God called you to do. Remember what we saw in the, in the verse. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul. Something they were actively actively engaged in doing and God then spoke to them and said dedicate these two men for for ministry and for service the word also shows that we have a responsibility to God think about this now I don't know how often you think about what your salvation means and what your proper response to salvation should be God purchased you on the slave market of sin by the cost of his son that he sacrificed on the cross, you have a responsibility to him. You're his adopted child, which carries responsibilities, but you're also his doulos, his slave, which carries responsibilities. The worship of God, the, the being active in ministry, is your responsibility. It is the logical, direct result of God saving you. If you don't do those things, if you just, if church to you is what you do for an hour on Sunday morning when you don't have something else to do, you're not engaged in worship. You're engaged in a club. And that's not what the church is to be. When we look at the church in Antioch, we see that they were worshiping God collectively. 
The worship of God was not simply singing music from their video projectors. Their worship of God involved listening to the directions God gave them. I think this is a remarkable thing. That as they're worshiping God, in whatever fashion that was, God spoke to them and they set apart Paul and Barnabas. In the middle of worship, God speaks to you and gives you direction. When we look at Acts 13.2 and understand the definition of worship, we see the church of Antioch wasn't just listening to music. They were engaged with each other, listening to the direction of God. That's what real worship is. Engaged, listening to God. They understood they had a responsibility to serve God in their worship. Now jump over to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, verse 27. For they were pleased to, to do it, and indeed they owed it to them. For if the Gentiles had come to share their spiritual blessings, they, all, they ought also to be of service to them in the material blessings. The word worship here, or liturgia here, is the word service. They also ought to be of service to them in material blessings. The result of our salvation is that we're to worship God through our service of others. Here in the book of Romans, we, we have the picture of people that have been saved being of service to care for others. That's your responsibility. That's how you worship God. Not just through singing of songs, but through how you take care of others. Now, go back a few verses in Romans chapter 15 to verse 15 and 16. But on some points I've written to you very boldly by the way of reminder because of the grace given me by God. To be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In verse 16, the word minister is the Greek word liturgia. So when we pull all this together, the church worships God and our personal accountability to God for what he's done for us. Think about it. He rescued you, purchased you from the slave market of sin and gave you eternal life. You didn't earn eternal life. It's not payment for what you did. It's a gift he gave you. The proper response to that should always be a sense of obligation to him which is borne out in how you worship him our worship of God is not simply singing a few songs that make us feel good it is service and dedication to God in being obedient to him and serving others and serving him we must also remember that the word liturgy includes the idea that worship is a very high status and something we must do which includes your involvement it's not something you just experience. It's something you're actively engaged in. When we sing, sometimes you guys look like somebody stole your cat. I'm, I'm just calling it the way I see it. Sometimes you don't look like you're engaged in worshiping God. He's making me stand again. I just want to sit down. Consider what Jesus did, the creator, sustainer of the universe. Left his throne in glory and became part of the box to suffer the agony of the cross and the agony of separation from his triune Godhead that he had never been separated from. We should look like we actually love God when we sing about him. We should look like we actually care. Like we actually want a fellowship with him. Which leads us to our next thing that the church does. They fellowship. The simplest process of God's people becoming relationally closer. The Greek word family is koinonia. 
We've all come from different backgrounds. We've all come from different places. Most of us would not know each other if it were not for the church. The same would be true in the early church as well, particularly as the church began to see Gentiles come in. As Paul and Barnabas and then later Paul and Silas, as they began to to go out in their missionary journeys and Gentile churches would, would come into being, these people wouldn't know each other otherwise. Paul from Tarsus, grew up in, in uh, Jerusalem, wouldn't know the people in Philippi, wouldn't know the people in, in Greece. That's not where he was. But God brought people together. And think about this. As the early church began to grow, you had slaves becoming Christians. And you have slave owners becoming Christians. Imagine how uncomfortable that was the first few times they got together. Slave, slave owner, right next to each other. And there they were, fellowshipping. Remember what they did in every service. They sang. They listened to people preach about what God had, was doing and had done. They had threefold communion every service. Now imagine what it would be like. To, have, to be a slave and have your slave owner right next to you. That's the way it was in the early church. Groups of people that wouldn't ordinarily associate with each other. Slaves didn't want to be friends with their masters. Jews certainly didn't want to be friends with Gentiles. Their entire world was all about being separate from the Gentiles. And now you had Gentiles and Jews together worshiping God. Remember what we saw in Acts 2.42. There it was. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the partaking of bread and the prayers, the fellowship. Or how about Romans chapter 15, verse 26. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution to the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. Or how about 1 Corinthians 10.16. The cup of blessing that... Uh, that we bless. Is it not the participation in the blood of Christ? The bread which we break is not the participation in the body of Christ? Doesn't make sense yet, but I'll explain it. Or how about Galatians 2.9, and when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Or how about Philippians chapter 1, verse 5? Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. In Acts 2.42, fellowship. In Romans 15.26, contribution. In Acts, or in 1 Corinthians 10.16, participation. Galatians 2.9, fellowship. Philippians 1.5, partnership. All the same word, koinonia. All the same word. One Greek word, five different English words. You see that the biblical author used koinonia to speak of the new church becoming relationally closer. They are all adopted children of the king and creator, sustainer of the universe. Since they were all now brothers and sisters, regardless of whether they were Jews or Greeks, Gentiles or slave, or what their status was, they were all now related. That relationship began to change them. Look closer at the verses we just quickly went through. Romans 15, 26. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints. Predominantly Gentile churches took up a collection for the poor Christians in Jerusalem. The act was koinonia, or a sharing of the blessing given to the people by others who are related to them. It's exactly the same thing as our relationship with the church in Labul, Haiti. We haven't been there, but we bought their, their land for them. We gave them the money to build their building. That's just like the churches in Asia Minor taking up a collection for the church in Jerusalem because they no longer could feed themselves. Or maybe it's like the people went to church a few hours ago in Central African Republic 
and sat there in their, in their outdoor huts reading Bibles in Songo that you paid for. We haven't been there. None of us can speak Songo. But because of the koinonia, because of the relationship between us and them, we had the money, we bought the Bibles for them. Why did we do those things? Especially for people that we didn't know and might never see this side of glory. Because we're all family. And because God told us to have koinonia, care for the family. Or how about this passage? This, this one didn't make a lot of sense as I read it. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Koinonia is participation. Now think about this one. This, this one is, this, this should just wreck your whole day. When we, next week when we celebrate communion, we are participating, we are koinonia with Jesus in his sacrifice. We're sharing with him. We're participating with him. We're celebrating what he did. And because we practice threefold communion, we're going to be celebrating the past, present, and future aspects of our salva salvation. The koinonia we have with Jesus. We all, we call it communion. Community. Koinonia. With Jesus. There's also a sense that Jesus is telling us that he died on the cross and we participated with him in that cross. We fellowship with him because of that cross. On to Galatians. Did I go too far? I missed it. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. What Dr. Luke is recording, or what Paul is recording here, uh, when, when he uh, and Barnabas went down to Jerusalem and met with the council of, of apostles and elders, Peter, the, 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 the most vocal of the group, I just, just imagine it this way, Peter sees Paul and Barnabas walk in and he's heard a little bit about what's going on and he gets his secret handshake all set up. And he extends to Paul the secret handshake of being an apostle. We now recognize you to be on the same level as us. We're all apostles and we're going to send you out to the Gentiles. That's this word, koinonia fellowship together Philippians chapter 1 verse 5 because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now I love this use of koinonia partnership Paul was telling the church in Philippi that he was thankful for them because of the partnership they had with him in spreading the gospel Paul would go on to say that he was sure that since God began a good work in them, God will complete it. The Philippians helped to support Paul in his ministry. And they were engaged in ministry in themselves. They shared the ministry of serving God. Koinonia. Again, just as with worship, koinonia is always written in the active, never in the passive. No place in Scripture is koinonia a passive word. It's always active. You can't participate in church by being passive. And yet that's what we've taught the Western world. Teaching. The didactic or didasco word family. This might be my favorite one along with preaching. I love to teach and preach the Word of God. Take a look at 2 Timothy 2, 4. I'm sorry, 4, 2. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. The word we want to focus on here is teaching, which is the Greek word didaxis, which we, from which in our English language we get the word didactic which means intended to teach. 
I'm a didactic guy. I like to teach, no matter what it is. When I was a captain at the sheriff's office, I taught my guys below me how to do the things they needed to do. I started that out when I first became a supervisor. My roll calls in, as a patrol sergeant. Every night at roll call, I'd have a different deputy come in and present a different law. Just bring us a law and teach us about it. And so every night for five, ten minutes, we worked on a different law. Teaching. Here in 2 Timothy, Paul is telling you, pastor is telling the youthful Pastor Timothy, as he this is this is at the end of Paul's time. He's in prison. He's gonna die. He he expects at any moment the doors of the prison cell are going to open up and the executioner is going to be there in his executioner's hood and take him out and kill him. And so he's writing to youthful Pastor Timothy who's going to take over the reins of the Apostle Paul Evangelistic Association. And he's saying, listen, be prepared to teach all the time. Teaching can take on several forms as we read here. Reprove. That's correction. Nope, you got that wrong. Or rebuke. Uh, that's not my favorite. That's where you have to, have to chide or censure or even blame someone. It's calling someone out for getting it wrong. As a biblical teacher, it's my responsibility to point out bad doctrine and theology. It's my responsibility to prevent it from occurring. And sometimes that's confrontational. Or how about exhortation? Exhort. It's a cool word that means to encourage, but it's so much more than that. The root of the word means to come alongside. On Wednesday, Miss Linda's going to have surgery on her foot, and she's not going to be able to use her foot for a while. Most of us would get crutches. That is this word. But because coordination might be an issue, she's going to have something else that comes alongside, a little knee scooter. I personally think she's going to kill herself on it. <laughs> because it requires... I can't do different things with hands and feet and stuff at the same time. And that's what she's going to have to do. But her knee scooter, next Sunday you'll see it. It's the perfect illustration of coming alongside and supporting. That's exhortation. As she gets from there to here, she'll be one leg on the floor and one leg on the knee scooter so her, her foot isn't on the ground getting stomped on. That scooter is going to provide her support so that she remains balanced in theory. Yeah, I know, I'll pay. It's the physical therapist watching, walking beside you. You know, they put the belt on you and they hold you. As you're walking around, that's exhort exhortation. It's the person that works with you to help you understand a theological point. It's not just me. We all have discussions about things. It's that person that helps you understand. It's that person that calls you to encourage you to do what God has called you to do. Within our ministerium group here in, in the District of Florida, there's a few of us that reach out to each other on a weekly basis just to encourage. And I've picked up a new one recently that's been calling me. And it's very encouraging on Sunday morning just to get a text. Hey, I'm praying for you this morning, brother. Just, to, just a couple minutes. I do the same thing for a couple others. We spread it around all over the district. Just encouraging each other. That's this concept here. Look at verse at Matthew chapter 5, 2. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, He taught them. Jesus taught them. Do you recall a while back while we were beginning the Beatitudes in the Gospel of Matthew? Jesus began to teach his disciples. You know, he'd gone up the side of the mountain a little ways. And I'd like to think that he sat down for a little bit and had a little bit of food. And he's just, you know, he, he was getting away from the crowds as he begins the Sermon on the Mount. He starts with the Beatitudes. And as he's teaching, 
more and more people fill in the base of the mountain. So that he's now teaching a bunch of people. That's my goal. To present you what God has said in his word so that you can understand it and comprehend it. That's the goal of teaching the Bible. Is making it relational to people. Putting it in a context that you can understand it and then respond to it appropriately. Paul would say in Colossians 3.16... Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. I don't need to explain this verse a whole lot. I think you get the picture. You are to learn the word of God through your interaction with it so that you can help others interact with it and worship God. Now, another thing that the church does is preaching. That's the Greek word kerso or kerygma, the word family. Not to be confused with teaching, but preaching. Jump over to Romans chapter 10. Romans 10, 15. And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. The word preach here is used to focus on an activity that invokes a response. What's the difference between teaching and preaching? Teaching is so that you learn something. Preaching is so that you do something. So I'm trying to preach this morning for Faye. Faye loves it when I preach. I think I'm more more of a teacher than a preacher, but I'm trying to do that for Faye. I'm trying to get you to invoke a response. Listen to what God has said and then do it. That's the goal of preaching. The word is used exclusively in the New Testament to refer to those who herald the truth of God's word. Not simply to teach it, but to proclaim it or to announce it to the world. It's different from teaching in that teaching is designed to convey knowledge while preaching is designed to invoke a response. Preaching is used in the New Testament to establish us in our faith. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. I love the Apostle Paul. Sometimes I don't love the way he writes so much. But this is one of my favorite passages, one of the favorite verses from Paul. Here the Apostle Paul is writing to the church he had spent many years in, talking about the way God brought them to salvation. Look at what he says. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. I didn't always get it right, he's saying. I didn't always say the right thing. I didn't always have three points of prayer in a poem. I didn't always get it in the right order. I didn't do it right, but God used it anyway. This is my guy here, because he's talking about me. I don't always get it right, but God can use it anyway to invoke a response in you to follow and worship and minister and serve and fellowship. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 17, Paul's writing again to young Pastor Timothy, getting ready to take over the ministry. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I, would, I was rescued from the lion's mouth. In this verse we focus on the word message. That's the word kerygma. The work of God standing alongside Paul to ensure that the message is given out. Despite his inabilities, despite the struggles, despite the fact that he's now in prison, the gospel was still going out. Titus chapter 1, verse 3. And at the proper time, manifested in, this, in, in his word through the preaching, kerygma, with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. Paul adds an additional element here. 
The invoking of a response through the preaching is in God's timing. That tells me that the Holy Spirit has to be working in you before you get here to make you prepared to hear what God's saying. See, it's not just me. I have to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. And He has to prepare your heart. You have to cooperate by getting prepared. I just love it how Satan works on Sunday mornings. If you've got kids in your house, when are you going to have trouble? Sunday morning, trying to get ready for church. If you're going to have car problems, when is it going to be? Sunday morning, so you can't get to church. Something always comes up. Paul said, at the proper time, when the Holy Spirit has made things right, the preacher will say the right thing. Not my fault, his fault. He does it, not me. I'm not guilty, he is. He's the one that orchestrates it. The Apostle Paul writing to Titus reminds him that the preaching of the Word of God is a command by God. It also happens at the proper time commanded by God. God's timing, not our timing. The last thing we do in the church is serving. Diakonia. From where we get our English word deacon. Servant. Remember in the book of Acts, the apostles got so busy they couldn't wait on tables anymore. What they do? They appointed seven men to do that. What were those men called? Diakonos, deacons, servants. Final thing the church does is to serve. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 25. To take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas has turned aside to go to his own place. In this verse, Dr. Luke is relating to how Matthias was appointed as an apostle to take the place of Judas. The word ministry here is diakonia. Ministry. The church is involved in ministry. Acts chapter 1, 6 through, or chapter 6, 1 through 4. Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. The Gentile Jews, well, it's the wrong way to say it, the, Gent the, the Jewish people from outside of Israel, okay, they weren't getting their food. They were all still in Jerusalem, but they weren't getting their food. Only the, only the, the Jewish Jews, the, the, the Hebrew Jews, the Jews that lived in Jerusalem were getting fed. And so there became a little revolt. Hey, why aren't we getting our stuff? And so the apostles no longer could take care of it. And the twelve summoned the full number of disciples. And it's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Diakonia. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the diakonia of the word, the ministry of the word. Here the words used in different ways. First in the traditional sense of serving tables in the church. What would become the role of deacon? The second use is the, in the word ministry. The apostles also understood what they were doing in preaching and teaching the word of God was a service, a di diakonia to the people. One last verse, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. Paul here is talking about the gifts God gives to the church in the form of apostles and prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. These gifts are given to the church by God for what purpose? To train the purpose, or to train the church for the purpose of serving, for the purpose of ministry. My job here is not to do the ministry. That's your job. My job is to train you, to prepare you, and lead you. And then scold you, and rebuke you, and chide you, and, and exhort you, and all that kind of stuff. Okay? You're the ministers. We shouldn't call pastors ministers. We should call the church ministers. 
Because that's what the Apostle Paul here tells us you're to do. You're all looking forward to this conclusion. So for three messages now, we've looked at returning to being the church. By that I mean returning to being what God intends for us to be. So let's recap that. The church day one. The church day one was all about proper teaching of what the apostles had learned from Jesus. You know, I, I like to think of myself kind of in the vein of the apostle Peter. Think of what's all welled up inside of him. Day one. He had spent three and a half years with Jesus. He'd had a little, couple little fights with Jesus there at the end. No, you're not going to wash my feet. Yeah, okay, I'll take a whole bath. No, that's not the way we need to do it, Peter. Peter, you're going to deny me three times. No, I won't. I'll die for you. Get away from me, little girl. I don't even know who you are. I don't know who that is. Finally, after Jesus' resurrection, getting that figured out, getting that solved, the grace and mercy that Peter experienced, not just by the cross of Jesus, by the fact that the risen Savior would then forgive him for rejecting him. Peter had all that bottle, bottle up inside of him, and he just wanted to push it out. Day one, the church was all about listening to those stories, listening to those things that Jesus had taught. All throughout the Old Testament, we have biblical examples that Jesus would bring up later in his sermons to them. So day one, they were focused on Jesus' mission. People were communicating with God. They were focused on communicating with God. The church is people who have bound themselves together in a spiritual community through the application of their spiritual gifts from the Holy Spirit. So what does the church... What, 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 who is the church or what is the church? The church are people that worship, which we understand to be more than just singing a few songs together. We understand worship to involve our seeing God clearer for who He is and what He's done. And then responding to that. The church fellowships, which we understand means as adopted children of God, we become closer to Jesus and to each other. Joint heirs to all that God has. Caring for and fellowshipping with and providing for each other. The church is engaged in the teaching of God's Word. Learning, gaining knowledge of who God is and what He's done. The church is engaged in preaching God's Word. Not focused on gaining knowledge, but on invoking a response. The church serves God and serves each other. The church that is related to each other, that loves each other that learns what God has told us to do and actually does it by serving each other. Now the last thing that we saw is it's active, not passive. All of these things that the church does and who the church are are active. There is no place in the church for passivity. There's no place in the church for people that just sit on their butts. That's not what God said to do. Imagine what it's like to be the church in China today as they actively execute Christians for being active in ministry. I related to you last week something that Francis Chan says in his book, The Letters to the Church. He was talking with a Chinese pastor, a leader of multiple house churches. And the pastor related how he was saddened by the fact that the Chinese government had decreased, had stopped doing all of the, the, the things that they were doing against the church. He said, we're not as active as we used to be. It's easier for us to go to church, and so it's not as important anymore. And the leader in the Chinese church actually was praying that persecution would continue and would gain strength. That is completely antithetical to the way we think but it is the way that true worship happens. God doesn't want us to just come here for an hour and a half on Sunday and sing a few songs and listen to me bloviate. That is not what God calls us to do. 
God wants you to be active in your relationship with each other and with Him. That means you take time every day to talk to Him and to listen to Him. He wants you active in reading and learning and applying His Word. He wants you active in helping with each other and caring for each other. He wants you to be active in teaching and preaching the Word to others. Some of you say, well, I can't do that. You absolutely can do that. Peter was just a fisherman. He wore Pine Island Reeboks. You know what those are? Those are those white boots, those white plastic boots that fishermen wear. We call those Pine Island Reeboks. He was out there in a world that was not an educated world. And he extended the right hand of fellowship to a guy who was an attorney and well-acclaimed scholar, Paul. Every one of us has the right and the responsibility to learn and teach His Word to those around us. The body of Christ, that's what the church is. We're being prepared for the return of the groom. Remember how it worked in those days? The wedding arrangements, the 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 time when, when people got engaged was arranged. The dowry was paid. The bride price was paid. And the bride had a responsibility. You wait for the groom and you get ready. And the groom went, went off and added a, an addition usually to mom and dad's house. And then when the groom was ready, the bride better be ready. Because when he came back to town and, and said, okay, let's have the wedding party, a week of celebration. If she wasn't ready, the family forfeited the bride price. And he went and got somebody else. We're the bride of Christ. Jesus has gone to heaven. What does John tell us? What did, what did he tell us? Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions, many dwelling places. I go and prepare a place for you. He's there now preparing a place for us. And he'll come back again. When? Maybe today. Maybe before we get done. How cool would that be? Rapture of God. God. We have to be ready. Your job as a, as a follower of Jesus is to be ready for Jesus to return. I know I said one last verse, but here's one more. It was granted her to be clothed, to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. The church, the body of Christ is to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and pure, which are our righteous deeds. Trust me. You want to do everything you can so that at the marriage supper of the Lamb, you're not sitting in there in your bright white bikini. You don't want to see that. You want bright flowing robes. If my righteous deeds make up my garment for the marriage supper of the Lamb, you want me to do a lot. Because I need a lot of clothes. You don't want me sitting there at the table in a bikini. That won't be glorious for anybody. But that's what Jesus is telling us here. You have a responsibility to be active, not passive. Now, I'm going to harp on this for a long time. Because we've, we've all had a funky winter. We've been in a funk. We've got to get active. That's why I've asked last Sunday and why Chuck did again this Sunday that we remain standing for, for, for uh, music. Why we're actively doing things to get you active because nothing in Scripture about serving God is passive. It's always active. The church is the body of Christ. And it's our responsibility to get prepared for Him to return. That requires you to do stuff. So this week... Let's do stuff. Thank you, Father. For the commands that you give us, for the direction that you give us, for the responsibility we have to follow you, to be obedient to you, to learn your word and teach it and preach it, to care for each other, to fellowship with each other. Remind us to be active every day, all day. Not just waiting to come together for an hour and a half on Sunday. Thank you, Father, for 
the sacrifice you made on our behalf. The sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. The fact that he didn't remain in the, on the cross or in the grave. But on the third day he rose from the grave and was victorious over death and sin. We so look forward to that day, Father, when you will put sin and death away forever. And eternity will spend with you, fellowshipping and worshipping you. What a glorious day that will be. Thank you, Father, for loving us. In Jesus' name. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.